Um, we're going to quickly run over what it means to talk about context and continuity and change over time. And we are going to examine the Silk Road. That's going to be our first stop. Uh, and then we're going to examine what, what I'm broadly calling the Pacific region, which covers East and Southeast Asia. Um, and then we'll have a practice question. And then we'll go ahead and we'll talk about the Atlantic region, AKA the, the slave trade, the triangle trade, um, something that I, I recently learned about called the bow tie trade, which is not as fancy as it sounds, but you'll see why it's called the bow tie trade. And then we'll have a little more practice after that. Awesome. All right, with that said, Let's go ahead and begin. As always, though, I encourage you, if you have a question, if while I'm talking or I'm streaming or we're doing a practice problem, uh, you want some clarification on something, I would highly encourage you to just go ahead and, um, you know, throw a question up in chat. I mean, I don't mind, you know, talking, but it's always fun to have you guys interacting, asking questions, makes the whole thing a little more lively. So welcome any questions that we got. Okay. Let's go ahead and get started. So here's a map of roughly where all the, the trade systems are uh, that we're gonna be talking about during this lecture, during this stream. Um, what do you notice about this map? We're just kind of looking at it. What do you notice about this map? These three systems that we're gonna be talking about. Does anyone, anyone see, can anyone spot something interesting about this map? What's interesting about this map in particular is that if you notice, there's a lot of overlap between the systems, right? The Pacific system, which goes through the Pacific Ocean, overlaps with the Atlantic system. And the Atlantic system, which covers most of the Atlantic area, overlaps with the Silk Road, which runs through the heart of Eurasia, which then overlaps with the Pacific system in China. And so one of the things to always keep in mind is that we do talk about separate trade routes, but there's always a lot of overlap. And the other thing to keep in mind here is that this is the era of global trade. This is the time when we're talking about the first truly trading networks that connect all parts of the world. And so that's a really big development to always keep in mind when we're talking about uh, this time period, the 1400s to the 1700s. This is the, the birth of truly global trade, truly transnational, international trade on a scale we never saw before because before we never had the Americas participating. And so now we have this truly global system. So it's always one thing to keep in mind while we're on the topic of context. So real quick, I wanna to touch base and just um, review what exactly we mean when we say continuity and change and what we mean when we say contextualization um, in this particular lecture. So continuity and change, which is one of the historical reasoning skills, AKA something to do on a long SAQ or a DBQ, and sometimes might even be asked of an SAQ, um, can be thought of as, as studying an event or development on a timeline. So if it would help, you can think of it visually as a timeline. And so essentially what you're doing is you're comparing um, a process and the process over time. So a good way to think about this is when you do comparison, in either an SAQ, an LAQ, or a DBQ, you're comparing two places, right? Place A and place B. You're gonna compare China and Europe. You're gonna compare Africa and India. You're gonna compare the Americas and Europe with the, S, the, the Mexica and the Inca, right? That's what we would call a comparison across space, right? But continuity and change is somewhat the opposite of that. It's a, not a comparison across space. It's a comparison across time and the way to think about that is you're usually just examining one place, but you are examining it over a long period of time. So for example, uh, an earlier stream that I did included examining China over a very long period of time, examining how things in China changed. Um, how many of your, if any of your teachers had you doing any sort of change or continuity uh, activities? Has anybody written an LEQ involving change and continuity or seen SAQ questions? 
involving change and continuity? You just go ahead and throw those up in chat uh, if, if your teacher has seen those or, or has, sorry, if your teacher has shown you those, uh, just go ahead and throw those up in chat. Uh, Iris says practice LEQ and SAQ. Interesting is it, was it, uh, Iris, was it a, a CCOT? Was the question involved change in continuity over time? Well, uh, go ahead and uh, just uh, touch, we'll touch base on that in a bit. So that's what continuity and change is. Same place, long period of time. Contextualization, in a nutshell, is sort of the what and the why of a historical situation of a development or a process. And so for this stream, we're going to talk about developments and processes along these trade routes. And we're going to talk about potentially the what and the why their historical situations. An easy way to think about this, just for this particular stream, is that context, when I discuss the context of these trade routes, I'm going to be discussing developments that are related to themes that are not strictly economic or trade themes. So in other words, trade routes usually have you talking about trade things. Uh, when we discuss the context of these trade routes, we're gonna talk about other things besides trade, but that they had an effect on trade. And so that's when I, this whole stream being contextualizing the continuity and change, we're gonna talk about the, uh, the things that led to the continuity or led to the change. Eric, um, you said you've had your kids evaluate the extent of some changes. Ooh, the extent to which, that's always a good, the extent to which language, which we, we now see on LEQs. Uh, it's always good, hedging, uh, using hedging language. So not describing change as absolute or continuity as absolute, but always to a degree, there was more continuity than change or there was more change than continuity. It's always a, an important thing. Iris's commodities over time and the effects on them. Okay, so trade effects and on, on a particular area, it sounds like. That's very cool, that's awesome. So we're gonna go ahead and, and keep on going. We're gonna get started by talking about the Silk Road. We're gonna talk about the Silk Road. And before we get going, I have this picture right here I'd like you to look at, this little, this little sketch uh, on the right side here. Now this sketch is from around the 1800s, uh, the early 1800s. The date is not entirely, uh, not entirely clear. Um, but it's from Kashgar, which is a city along the Silk Road in China. Uh, during the Qing Dynasty. And a Kashgar, if I'm actually remembering correctly, is one of the cities you have to be familiar with for the uh, Unit 2. It's one of the illustrated examples of a trading city. Um, so you have this painting, uh, you have this, this sketch of Kashgar. What do you notice about, about what do you see in this, in this particular sketch? We're just kind of looking at this sketch here on the right. What do you see? What, do you, what, is, what is being depicted here? We just kind of take a look at this lovely, what I assume is pencil painting. Eric threw up the camel emoji. I didn't even know they had a camel emoji. That's crazy. That's awesome. Camel emoji. Dig it. And even more interesting is that uh, these particular camels that you see depicted here, this is the, uh, this is the two hump camel. This is the, uh, this is the uh, Bactrian dromedary camel, which is famous for having two humps versus the more famous Arabian camel, which only has one hump. Oh, and there's even a second, you can, you can have one hump or two hump camels emojis. That's so interesting, that's so cool. Technology, it's amazing, isn't it? Um, Iris says the landscape. Yeah, and so the landscape, which looks like it's flat and perfect for trading, right? But also the animals, right? And so if this is a, if this is a map of the Silk Road, or this is a, a painting on the Silk Road, you notice that the animals used to trade on the Silk Road, and these 
pretty much looked like the same animals you would have seen all the way back in the Honda dynasty, right? If we go way back to even before the course starts, right? You know, this is from the 1800s, but if you went all the way back to the 1400s, you'd still probably see these kind of animals, you know, moving around the Silk Road. And so it's sometimes paintings can tell us a lot about how things change or, or don't change. But outside of trade, a couple things, there was a lot of change going on along the Silk Road during this time. So one of the big changes was during the, during the 1400s, the 1500s, the 1600s, we see the, what I'm describing as the end of nomadic states, that is states that are ruled primarily by horse riding steppe communities. You guys probably can think of the most famous nomadic state that was formed uh, in Unit 2. If anyone knows the, the name, the famous Empire of Exceptions. No one got it? The famous Empire of Exceptions? It's going to make me wait for it. Miguel says the Mongols, yes, it is the Mongols. And so what we see here along the Silk Road during this time is we see the end of states somewhat like the Mongols. And so one of the last great nomadic empires was what are called the Timurids who ruled over Persia for about 150 years. And their state came to an end in 1507 when their last leader was uh, ousted from power. Uh, they were replaced by the Safavid dynasty, who you we've talked about, I've talked about on streams. Varun and, and Charlie are going to talk about them on Sunday. Um, they are replaced by the Safavids, who are not nomadic states. They are, in fact, settled, um, settled empires, although they do have some nomadic features. They're definitely not purely nomadic states. You also have the sort of successor Mongol states in what's now Mongolia, and you have the Uyghur states who are another nomadic group of people in what's now Western China, um, being conquered by the Qing dynasty around 1700. And so 1450 to 1750 really sees kind of the close of the nomadic state, right? We see kind of an end to horse nomads, being able to burst out of the steppes and dominate the settled parts of the world, being able to conquer China, being able to conquer Iran and conquer Russia. Um, that sort of, th that chapter in history sort of comes to an end during this time, in part because of um, technology, but in part because of the establishment of more settled empires. And probably the three most famous ones would be the, the Mughals, the Safavids, and the Ottomans. I've alluded to the Qing dynasty up here. These dynasties, these, dynasties, these powerful states, um, were able to form strong enough bureaucracies, militaries, and societies uh, to be able to resist any kind of nomadic incursion that might have come out of Central Asia, if there even had been one. Uh, but there wouldn't have been because all of the territory, if you will, was now occupied by bigger powers. And of course, one thing that um, really kind of puts a damper on nomadic life would be gunpowder. And gunpowder played a really big role in the rise of these three empires, the Ottomans, the Safavids, and the Mughals. They're collectively known as the gunpowder empires. But gunpowder puts a big damper on, uh, on nomads and their ability to wage war. Because you don't need to know how to ride a horse. You don't need to know how to use a bow. If you have a gun and you have some training, you can resist nomadic incursions. That's not to say the Mongols didn't use gunpowder, but these empires used it better. And so I have two phenomena, I have two phenomena that I'm going to describe here. And what I'd like you to, guys to do in the comments is to, to think about this and tell me if this is a continuity or a change. And so I have two phenomena on the Silk Road. I have Persian art styles and under the Timurids and under the Safavids, uh, Persian art styles continued to, to be the medium of intellectual exchange. That's to say that if you lived in Central Asia and you wanted to be considered educated or smart, uh, you would use Persian in your writing, you'd use Persian in your poetry, 
Um, the Ottomans were Turks and the Mughals were Central Asian nomads, um, but both of them used Persian as their court language, despite not being Persian ethnically. So Persian art and Persian language continued to be, was, um, remained a powerful force. And the other thing is the, the use of caravans. And in particular, we know about the use of caravans because Isfahan, which is one of the great cities that Charlie and Varun are going to talk about on Sunday, had this huge marketplace that was built to accommodate all the caravans. And so my question for you guys is, are these two things, are these continuities or are these changes along the Silk Road? And considering what you know about the context, are these continuities or are these changes? What should we consider these developments? And so if you want to go ahead and throw that up in the uh, in the comment, I'll just wait. I'll, I'll give it. We'll give it a minute if you want to put your thoughts in the comments. Are these changes or are these continuities? And if you're not sure, I totally understand. Um, the Timurids don't get a lot of coverage, and Central Asia as a whole, outside the Mongols, don't get a lot of coverage. We we as history teachers have tended to do not a great job of of talking about them. If you'd like to learn more about either of these things, uh, I did include a link uh, among the resources for this stream uh, by a great history teacher named Bram Hubble, and he wrote an article about um, Persian language and Persian poetry in Central Asia during this time. So if you'd like to check that out and learn more, I highly encourage you to go read it. It's very readable. It's not a terribly long article, but it's awesome in detail. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this. So Persian art, Persian poetry, and Persian language, I'm gonna make the argument is a continuity. Now, why am I gonna argue this is a continuity? Well, we've seen cultural diffusion along the Silk Road of the past. I'm sure you can imagine at least one major religion or one major idea being spread along the Silk Road. Um, you should definitely have one of those, be able to pull one out of your pocket if you see a question like that. And Persian art and Persian culture continuing to spread along these Silk Road trade networks from Persia outward to the east into Inner Asia and to the west into the Ottoman Empire. I would argue that's a continuity of a long trade pattern, right? What's going on in Silk Roads and what's going on in trade networks is not always trade exclusive. And the use of caravans, I was good, would make the case, is also a continuity, right? Camels of all types continue to be used to transport goods, right? Part of the reason was because there simply wasn't a better alternative on the Silk Road. This is pre-steam engine. This is pre-train, pre-car, pre-plane. I mean, if you really want to get good materials overland, the only way you're going to do it is a horse or a camel. You don't really have any other options at this time. Now, what do we know about the Silk Road during this time. Why, why does this, maybe someone can help me out with this in the chat. Why does it seem though, like the Silk Road falls out of, loses its importance during this time period? Between 1450 and 1750, what do we seem to be talking a lot about when it comes to trade? We tend to be focused on certain things. So Miguel says maritime trade, overseas trade, right? We talk about overseas trade and maritime trade in the Indian Ocean, in the Atlantic Ocean, in the Pacific Ocean. We sort of just forget a little bit about the Silk Road, but if you're nowhere near the ocean and you need to get goods from place A to B, you're going to have to go on the old Silk Roads. And so there's definitely a decrease in volume on the Silk Road during this time. But even as late as the 1990s, and even arguably today, um, there are still business being done on the Silk Road. Things that you're too far away from the sea to effectively get them to see, but you don't have to take them so far as to put them on a plane. 
Um, the Silk Road's volume may decrease, um, but its its contents are still need to, needed to be taken over land. So I hope these examples of continuities uh, provide a little clue. Um, so we're going to pause here really quick. I do see that someone has a question. Um, Iris says, when explaining why it's a continuity or change, it's good to talk about the patterns in the past and how they reoccur. Uh, yes, so one of the things about continuity and change is it is good to um, go back and describe how things used to be, simply as evidence of how they have changed or have not changed. So if we're gonna talk about changes on the Silk Road, and we're going to talk about how maritime trade has reduced its importance. The way I teach continuity and change is that you need to at least make some sort of indication that at one time, um, trade on the Silk Road was a really high volume uh, affair. So maybe during the Mongols, uh, you talk about, you know, during the Mongol times, we know that there was lots of business on the Silk Road, thanks to the Pax Mongolica or the Yam system or political stability. Uh, but now, with the development of fancy maritime technology from the Europeans, um, maritime trade uh, took over the volume of trade, and therefore a change in the Silk Road would be that there's less trade on the Silk Road by volume. So that would be just an example of how you can demonstrate a change in continuity over time. Hope that answer wasn't too wordy, Iris. I hope that maybe clear things up a little bit. Awesome, okay, cool. All right, then let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the Pacific. Let's talk about the Pacific. Now, this picture over on my left is perhaps one of the most interesting pictures uh, of this entire unit. I have this up on my school website for my, my individual class, but I just think it is so fascinating. Um, this is a painting from the 1600s of Portuguese merchants in Japan, painted by a Japanese artist. So this is the Japanese view of Portuguese sailors coming to their country and doing business. What's even particularly interesting is that the artist is not confirmed, and, and it's sort of a mystery as to who the gentleman, um, the dark-skinned gentleman in the center of the painting is because um, he does seem to be the center of this part of the painting. It's a much larger painting, but he seems to be the center of this part. And, you know, some scholars have assumed he might have been a Portuguese slave, but there's no definitive evidence. He might have actually just been um, a Portuguese sailor uh, who happens to be of African origin. And so this um, is a very interesting painting because it shows the collision of three worlds of Europe and of Africa and of Japan and their differing perceptions of each other. And for those of you who really dig samurai history, there's a new book out um, that tells the story of the only uh, samurai, tr what, what the author argues is a true samurai from, from, uh, from Africa. Uh, I believe the book is titled Afro Samurai, The Tale of Yasuke. That was his name. And it's a very fascinating book. I would highly recommend it if you're really into military history or or Warrior History is a great book uh, to read. It's a quick read too, you read it quick. Um, but let's talk about the Pacific region. So there was some things, there were some things going on in the Pacific region. So for example, in both China and Japan, we have the reestablishment of non-nomadic centralized rule. So Japan had been going through what's called the Sengoku period, which refers to the Warring States period, somewhat like feudalism in Europe had. Uh, the same time roughly. And this ends in 1600 when one of the feudal warlords, or I shouldn't say warlords, but one of the feudal daimyo, uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu, manages to uh, take control of the rest of the, the shogun, uh, the, the other lords, either directly or by alliance by marriage. And so we have, for the first time in a long time in Japanese history, um, an established settled uh, direct rule. Same thing goes in China. In China, we have the rise of the Ming Dynasty, 
immediately after the end of the Yuan Mongol dynasty, and then followed up by the Qing dynasty, which took China to its largest extent. So in Asia, after a short period of, you know, not centralized rule, uh, following the end of the Mongols, we have a restoration of centralized rule. And we also have the arrival of European sea merchants. Now that's not to say that Europeans had never been to Asia before, but this time was a bit different because they weren't coming over land like the famous Marco Polo. Now they were coming by sea and they were coming to do business. And what's really interesting is that they brought this religion called Christianity, which has a very fascinating history in Japan. Uh, the Japanese really dug Christianity, and some some of the feudal lords and some of the samurai even adopted Christianity. In fact, there was a samurai who went all the way to Rome to meet the Pope because he was so enthusiastic about this new religion. And there's a painting, um, maybe I can throw it up in the resources, there's a painting of this samurai in Rome uh, dressed in you know, his traditional samurai garb, but he's going to meet the Pope, and it's just a really just a really cool painting talk about like intersection intersecting civilizations um but these european merchants they set up companies uh or they set up colonies the portuguese for example set up a colony in malacca um, and the dutch east india company established itself in southeast asia and so europeans are now in the business of trade but they're also um busy uh, setting up colonies and trading posts which had been different from European merchants walking over the Silk Road to get to China and then walking back. So there's a little change going on there. And the last thing to really note that doesn't necessarily have to do with trade, but is really important is that there's actually a huge population explosion during this time, in part caused by the introduction of so many new uh, crops from the Americas. Uh, leads to a population boom in Asia. And you see uh, widespread Chinese migration in particular within Asia. <clears throat> lots of Chinese communities um, move to the Philippines. Lots of Chinese communities move to Vietnam. Uh, they move to parts of Southeast Asia, specifically the uh, Indonesia. This is in part why there are so many Chinese expatriate communities all over Asia, in Singapore, in Malaysia, in the Philippines, uh, this is when the Chinese started to move into Taiwan in large numbers. The way Taiwan is a Chinese is a is a is a nation that is strongly linked with the culture of China. And so these are some of the big things that are going on around the Pacific region. And Eric said the sweet potato noodles. Yes, sweet potatoes coming from China uh, were a a huge delicacy, or not a delicacy, but they they had a big impact. Potatoes as well. Um, in the sense that they allowed for greater cultivation, did not require as much water as rice did, and were very helpful in allowing China to explode in terms of population. Uh, in Japan, I recently read that there is a tomb to a farmer who is believed to have been the first farmer to bring sweet potatoes to Japan from the Philippines. Um, <clears throat> he has a tomb with a gigantic metal yam in front of it, or a, a gigantic metal sweet potato which is a really interesting thing to go see. So if you're ever in Japan, check out the tomb of the farmer with the sweet potato in front of it. Cool. So I have three things here, three things about the Pacific region, uh, specifically trade-wise. And while I'm describing them, if you guys could go ahead and chat and just tell me if you think these are changes or continuities uh, in the Pacific in terms of trade during this time. So, <clears throat> The Dutch East India Company, which I have abbreviated here VOC, per their common abbreviation, um, established a lot of trading posts in Southeast Asia, and they partnered with local female merchants. And there is a great article that I've linked in these resources that explain that in Southeast Asia, females actually played a very large role in facilitating trade between Europeans um, and locals. And it's, uh, there's a lot of interesting dynamics that go on within those relationships, both trade and the personal relationships. Um, and so there's that. There's the Dutch East India Company partnering with local merchants. And there's also the Chinese merchant communities in Manila. Now, Manila, which I think I actually misspelled here. I think it only has one M, uh, has one L. Uh, Manila is the capital of the Philippines in, in Spanish, the Spanish-ruled Philippines, um, which was about... 
about 30% Chinese, despite it being a Spanish city and a Spanish colony, about 30% of the population was Chinese. Um, and they played a really big role in facilitating communication between mainland China and this Spanish colony in the Philippines. In fact, the Philippines are exactly where China got the sweet potato from. Um, <clears throat> it had been brought over from America and a Chinese merchant from the Philippines took it back to China and said, hey, check this out. Um, specifically, they were looking for food that could help alleviate a local drought. And that's how the sweet potato got to China. Um, <clears throat> officially during this time for the, chi um, the Chinese, it was never an official decree, uh, but China gradually reduced the ability of foreigners to come trade in their port. Um, they established something called the Canton system. Uh, and Japan just straight up said, we don't want any foreigners in our ports. And the, um, the edict that's referred to as the closed country edict, which came down in the 1640s and then went for about 150 years, uh, basically sealed the country from outsiders with the exception of the Dutch, um, <clears throat> who got to come to Nagasaki once a year and trade on one island and were not allowed to leave the island or talk to anybody who wasn't a Japanese merchant. So both governments made official efforts to limit uh, their contacts with the outside world to limit trade. And last but not least, we have the galleon system. Now, the galleon system is a term for these gigantic Spanish ships um, that were loaded with the silver from South America and then traveled across the Pacific and landed in the Philippines where they then unloaded that silver and it was sent either to China to trade for goods or it might have been sent over to India or other parts of Southeast Asia uh, to trade. And so that's the galleon system. So <clears throat> if you guys could go ahead and take a look at those and tell me if you think are these things changes or continuities? So Iris says she thinks change. Now they don't have to necessarily all be the same thing. One could be change, one could not be change. And then the third one could be change. So just taking a look at those, um, if anyone wants to, wants, wants to throw their thoughts out there, are these changes, are these continuities? What do you think? So Iris says change. Iris, which one do you think is a, a change? Or do you think multiple ones are changes? middle one might be a continuity well, could be and the third might be a change what makes you let's why don't we drill down on this a little bit why do you think in particular the third one is a change why would the third one be a change in particular what makes you think that one Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'll go ahead and break these down for you. Text size is going to change a little bit. So, Iris says major transitions adapting to global commerce. Well, you're right about the global commerce part, right? But what makes the galleon system such a fundamentally different thing? This third block about the galleons. What makes this so fundamentally different? was that before 1450, there would have 
been no silver coming from the Americas, and therefore there would have been no system of gigantic ships to bring this silver from across the uh, Pacific from the Americas to Asia. And so that is arguably undeniably a change. Now, that is not to say that silver was not traded in Asia. Um, <clears throat> as some scholars have pointed out, Japan actually used to be a huge silver source before the Potosi mines were discovered. So it's worth noting that the silver part might not be a change, but the, the internationalness, the fact that silver is now coming all the way across the ocean from America, that's a big, that's a big change. Um, the funny thing about China and Japan is that they'd actually made efforts to try to regulate trade in the past. China in particular, you might remember that the Ming Dynasty had this great navigator named Zheng He, um, who sailed into the Indian Ocean and spread the word of the Chinese government. And he, these voyages were massive, but the Chinese government in the end decided to discontinue this. And they in fact tried to prevent under the Ming Dynasty they tried to prevent trade with the outside world. Now that was obviously, they didn't have the power to enforce that. But it's worth noting that the governments of China and Japan did try historically to also limit trade with the outside world. Um, mostly just because they wanted to have some kind of control over it. Not because they didn't want to trade and not because they were afraid of outsiders. They just wanted to control the trade. This trade is money. What's important to know about these developments about the participation. Sometimes when we talk about Europeans uh, participating in trade, and this goes for the Indian Ocean too, so this is also applicable to the Indian Ocean, is that Asians did not disappear, so to speak, the minute Europeans showed up. They continued to play a role. They continued to participate. Uh, they continued to be negotiators. They continued to be merchants. They continued to play a role. And so Europeans didn't just show up and then Asians magically vanished. Um, they continue to play a role uh, as much as anybody else. And so it's important to keep that in mind. Is that uh, Through this example of the Chinese in Manila and the Philippines and um, <clears throat> the famed female merchants of Indonesia, that Asians continue to play a role uh, in negotiating and organizing trade. And on that note, I have a practice problem for you guys. And so I have a picture here, which is from the 1800s, and it's a painting that depicts the three social groups in Spanish Manila, three out of the main, the four main social groups. You have what is called, you have a native Filipino woman on the left. You have what's called a sangre, which is a mixed Chinese Filipino individual in the middle. Um, and then you have regular Chinese merchants on the end. Uh, and this is a depiction of these merchants in Manila in the, in the 1800s. Uh, this was a fairly common thing. For those of you who might have attended, I believe it was Jed's lecture on uh, social hierarchy. You might remember that in Spanish America, there was a somewhat of a mixed uh, racial hierarchy where everybody was classified based on either how European they were, how native they were, how African they were. It was the same thing in the Philippines. How native, how, how Filipino were you? How Chinese were you? How European were you? And that was your, there was a position in society for you, depending on the answer to that question. And so what I'd like you guys to do is go ahead and taking a look at this painting, could you explain the following, how the following image represents some sort of trade change to trade in Asia during this time period based on the painting? that you see here. So we're thinking about a trade change, something that changed. And so when I'm looking at this painting, I'm focusing on three things immediately catch my eyes. <clears throat> One of the things that immediately comes to my attention is that um, we have individuals of Chinese descent and I'm thinking about how their presence in the Philippines increased their connections with China, the Philippine connections with China. As we can see from the individuals on the right who are Chinese. And I'm also thinking that Manila was the spot where silver flowed into China 
So I'm thinking about the silver trade and how Chinese merchants probably also played a role in that trade. And I'm also thinking about that food because I see that there's a picture of people having food and tea over here. And I'm thinking that American food crops were also transported into uh, China via the Spanish Philippines. So I'm keeping all these things in my head and I want to formulate a possible answer to the question of how does this painting represent change? What in this painting represents a change in the economics of Asia during this time period? And so if anybody wants to go ahead and attempt that and just throw up, maybe not a whole answer, but just like their thoughts in chat, I'll wait a minute, then we can go ahead and take a look at that. Iris asks, does the man on the left haircut have any significance? Oh, you mean the man on the, oh yes, the man on the left. Um, that's a good question. Is that a QU? That's a good question. I don't know. If he was Chinese, and this would have been the time when the QU was being worn, and if he wanted to identify himself as Chinese, then that might be the QU. I'm actually not entirely sure. That's a good question. It's an awesome question. So I'm gonna go ahead and just share my thoughts on, if you were to see this kind of document on an SAQ, a possible answer that uh, you could potentially put. So if you saw a document like this and you were asked to consider how this represents a change in international commerce in Asia, you could say something like this. The photo on the left represents a change because the establishment of a Spanish colony in the Philippines increased the scale of trade between Europe and China because of how physically close the Philippines are to China. And so I would make the argument that the very existence of this Spanish colony is a fundamental change uh, because of its close proximity and the fact that it is so close. Um, means that there's a lot hard, a <clears throat> larger volume of trade, and therefore this is fundamentally different from previous trade. Now, if I was to write an LEQ paragraph, I might have to go into a bit more detail in this, but this would be an example of an SAQ length question. All righty. Are there any questions about that before we go ahead and wrap this on up by talking about the Atlantic? And I'll have another uh, practice question for you guys, so not to worry. We'll get you in there. So the Atlantic region probably saw, saw quite a bit of change during this time. I mean, I don't even need to tell you about, you You have probably in class uh, fleshed out all the colonial empires. You've probably talked about Spain. Uh, you've probably talked about Portugal and England and France. You've probably spent a lot of time fleshing out those colonial empires. But uh, just to note that they are one of the largest changes to this entire hemisphere during this time was the establishment of uh, European political uh, empires in the Americas, the Spanish Americas, uh, in Mexico and South America, Portuguese in Brazil, the English on the coast of North America, and the French up in Canada. Uh, you have this, these new empires and all the, the social change and political change and economic change that comes with it. But for the sake of ours, there's an increased trade with West Africa. Something that's going on during this time is there's just a good deal more trade with West Africa. Both sides are uh, increasing their demand um, on each other. Europeans are demanding more 
goods than before. And in response, Africans are also demanding and taking a larger role in asserting more goods than before. And you also begin to see a certain growth in what we would call manufacturing. So with the increase in all this trade, right, um, textiles, guns, gum, and I don't mean gum like the kind you chew in class when you shouldn't. I mean gum like the sticky stuff that would hold a ship together, uh, the tar, if you will. So with all this uh, material flowing around, so if you have an increase in gum, which allows you to make ships, um, you're probably going to make more ships. <clears throat> and so we begin to see all over the world, and the Atlantic region in particular, the growth of manufacturing. In England, there was a growth in gun manufacturing. In the Atlantic colonies, so in what's now New York, uh, parts of Maine and uh, in, in New England, there was an increase in ship manufacturing, the construction of ships. And so we do see a growth in manufacturing of goods. So not just trading raw materials, but also actually manufacturing raw materials or manufacturing nice finished goods and not just i should mention just to clarify not just in north america and europe africa too was producing uh, more uh, finished iron as well as ivory carvings were really big and very in demand from africa i've included in the resources a link to um, a museum which had a number of items with accompanying explanations about the trade uh, between africa and uh, Europeans and Americans. Um, so I want to quick touch on three trades, and I'm going to explain more about this triangle trade here in a second. Um, you may have talked about the slave trade in class, and so in the Americas in particular, slaves were demanded because of the need for a labor source to grow cash crops. Um, but it also should be noted that West African states um, had always taken an active part in the trade and this behavior of taking an active part in the trade was also featured during this time the triangle trade and i'm going to show you a diagram in just a second so if you're not sure what the triangle trade is hold on we'll get to it um this refers to a circulation of goods and materials in the atlantic ocean you might have seen it in class uh, but it includes raw material from the new worlds from the americas such as timber and fish and, and other raw materials, cash crops from the Caribbean. Um, but it also included manufactured goods, such as from guns from England, as well as uh, iron and ivory carvings from West Africa, and textiles, which is a fancy way of saying stuff made out of cotton. And that came from both Africa, uh, sorry, from India, as well as from England. Now, you might be thinking, wait a minute, I saw the I saw the triangle trading class, and I don't remember India being on there anywhere. Well, hold on one second, and I'll show you exactly what I mean. Um, last but not least, the fur trade. Um, the fur trade is interesting. It takes place mostly in the northern part of North America, where France, Russia, and Britain sought to uh, acquire the furs that they wanted to sell back in Europe. Furs were very valuable during this time. It's part of the reason why so many beaver species have gone extinct, is the demand for fur. And the Native Americans who helped them acquire that fur. It's a very important element. So really quick, just in case you might have heard of the triangle trade, and I'd, I'd love to refresh you on that. Um, what I have right here uh, in the center of this map uh, is the traditional interpretation of the triangle trade in which you have uh, a triangle in the Atlantic Ocean right here, uh, which includes importing uh, Western Europe, sending finished goods down to Africa in return for slaves, slaves who were then sent across the way to the colonies, who then use the slaves to either grow cash crops or in some cases harvest natural goods, uh, and then send those raw materials back to Europe, who would then turn them into manufactured goods, send them down to Africa, and so on and so forth. But this traditional interpretation is missing a few pieces that are really important to understand. Um, first missing piece is that Africa provided way more than just slaves. Um, Africa produced iron that was in some cases on par with uh, European iron. You might have covered in class, I'm not sure since it's officially not part of the course anymore, um, something called the Bantu migrations. And those included 
the spreading of pre-existing uh, African iron technology from West Africa to the other parts of Africa. But what it testifies to is that Africans had iron producing technology as well. It wasn't just slaves for guns as has sometimes been asserted. It involved other goods too. There, however, is another triangle. And so if you tilt your head sideways, you can see two triangles. It kind of looks like a bow tie. Um, but the other triangle actually involves uh, India and the southern part of Africa, because what some historians have pointed out is that actually most of what was sold for slaves in West Africa was not manufactured goods from Europe. In fact, they might have even made up less than half. It was actually manufactured goods from India, uh, particularly cotton textiles were a huge seller. And made up, made up, made up 50% or more of all the goods sold for slaves. Um, and colonies in South Africa provided a stopping point. In particular, the Dutch East India Company required the South African colony with Dutch people in it to grow food so that ships could make the long journey to India and back. So that's why they sometimes refer to it as the bow tie trade, not just the triangle trade. All right, let's wrap this up really quick. I want to make sure we can get to a um, make sure we can get to a practice question. So. The fur trade, <clears throat> we're going to go backwards this time. I'm going to make the case that the fur trade is, in fact, a continuity. You could argue that the demand for fur was greatly increased, right? Pre-Columbian exchange, you didn't have anywhere near as many people demanding fur. Afterwards, you had a great increase in fur. But European acquisition of furs relied heavily on native expertise. So that native expertise, I will argue, is a continuity. When it comes to the triangle trade, it's very easy to argue this as both a continuity and a change. There is a fundamental change in the sense that the Americas are now connected to this gigantic trade network that had previously just been between Europe, Africa, and India. Now you have the Americas getting in on it too, and that's a fundamental change. Um, and in particular, the demand for slaves the sheer demand for slaves, which is why the slave trade can be argued to be a pretty radical change. Uh, just the sheer demand for slaves picked up during this time, uh, 13 million over the course of 200 years, or sorry, th uh, 13 million, sorry. Yeah, 13 million over the course of 400 years. I'm not sure my numbers right. Um, it was just an incredible amount of rapid demand. But anyway, so the triangle trade, because it's so complicated, you can argue change or continuity both ways on this one. Any questions before we move on to a quick practice question wrap up, and then I'll let y'all go. All right, then let's take a practice question. And then we'll go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this on up. So here's a multiple choice question that has a document attached to it. And so I'm going to go ahead and just read this real quick, um, which says that an accumulation of large quantities of cloth and displays of this accumulation come in part from the low price of the cloth. Acquiring cloth with unusual colors, designs, and textures shaped this consumption. This can be seen with the death of the king of Loango, a small kingdom in Central Africa, in 1624. Although Loango had produced an excellent cloth of its own and exported around 20,000 meters of it in 1611, the ruler's heirs proudly displayed a hoard of cloth from Asia, Europe, and other parts of Africa. So this is, by the way, what we call a secondary source, uh, which is not the most common thing to see on, an, on a... Um, multiple choice question, but you might see it. And so the question here is asking, what's the context in which this question is being asked, right? So this description, this passage uh, can be understood in the context of which of the following events. And so let's take a look at what our options are. One would be the European conquest of Mali Two would be African demand for foreign goods. C would be the rise of new plain states in West Africa. Plain states refers to like the big empires like the Songhai or Mali. Uh, 
and then D would be the rise of Islam in West Africa. Hmm. Interesting. I threw up a little poll with the possible answers. It's the very last poll. It says the multiple choice answer is, and then it's A, B, C, or D. Why don't you go ahead and vote on that, and then we'll go ahead and break it down real quick. Awesome, got a few votes. Okay. So it looks like the consensus is B, and the answer is indeed B. So by this time, the 1600s, uh, Islam was pretty established in West Africa. So it wouldn't be necessarily the rise of Islam, which had anything to do with cloth trading. Um, there were no new plain states after Mali large plain states. That's not to say that there weren't successor states, but there were no plain states. And so this one doesn't really make any sense either. And the Europeans never conquered Mali. So that's kind of, oh, oh, that's kind of a misnomer. You can throw that one out. And so B is correct. The African demand for foreign goods, uh, as we can see here, it wasn't just goods from Europe. It wasn't just guns. Uh, it might've been as simple as really fancy clothing. Uh, from Europe, from Asia, and even just from other parts of Africa. So, I just want to thank you all for your time and participation. And I'll sit here for about a I'll sit here for about a minute if anyone's got any questions. Uh, if not, then thank you so much, and I hope I'll see you around next time. And I hope we all have a, we all have a good rest of your night. Thank you so much for coming, Iris. Thank you so much for your participation. I'm uh, glad it helped. Thank you, everybody else who came.